So yesterday we um, talked about how a massive particle will move in the field of uh, a large number of other massive particles. And uh, we showed that uh, since most of the uh, perturbation from other discrete particles come from large distances, you can do a lot of uh, uh, fun algebra, and you can show that in large N systems, um, the relaxation time, which is the time in which uh, stellar orbits or particle orbits in the smooth potential changes significantly, is related to the crossing time, that is the time it takes to cross the uh, potential, to the number of other particles or number of total particles in the system through something like this. And from that we um, Calcul uh, estimated uh, the relaxation time and crossing time for uh, some uh, large N gravitational systems, large galaxies and global clusters. And we found out that given the ages of the galaxies and global clusters, the global clusters are relaxed systems and galaxies are unrelaxed systems. So in other words, um, what this really means is in galaxies, uh, the motion of most stars essentially follow the smooth part of the potential and is not governed by perturbations from other stars in the galaxy and exactly opposite in globular clusters. But the question is, how do you, um, how do you set things up? Uh, for the star's positions and velocities. That will be a valid um, gravitational uh, field. So, uh, not valid. By valid, I mean that uh, how can you set up the positions and velocities that will be uh, consistent with a self-gravitating system, okay? So that's what we are, um, we will build the formalism for that. Okay. Relaxed and? Yes. You, um, relaxed doesn't necessarily mean virilized, uh, but uh, I think you cannot have virilization without relaxation. Relaxed systems means. Uh, your initial phase space has lost its memory. So stars phase space, every star's phase space has been randomized. It is uh, actually, yes, it is a special property of the R square law because in a spherical system, as you go in further distances, the rate at which you grow the number of stars that can perturb you, that's the, that's the crucial thing, yeah. Yes, but there are more strong <laughs> precise tests of one over us. Right, um, so uh, it, it's pretty accurately measured in small scales, so it, it doesn't divert from one over R square law. So the question was, uh, uh, can you test the one over R square law for gravity and see whether there are other forms that get, has any weightage 
um, based on some coefficients and where it becomes important. Um, so for small scales, it has been that there is no need for any other corrections, um, unless V over C is very high. Um, in large scales, um, people are trying to do the so-called uh, modified gravity uh, type experiments, um, where the data essentially comes from the velocity dispersion of things. So you look at stars at different locations in the galaxy, and you try to measure the velocity dispersion of the star. So this is not the radial velocity that you're measuring. You're looking at some distance from the center, and you are taking a slice along that uh, perpendicular distance, and then uh, you are looking at some line, and since that slice will have actually have several distances, right, from the center, you get a broadening of the light distribution. And from that, you can tell what the dispersion uh, of velocities for that kinds of distances. Um, in cluster scales, it looks like Newtonian gravity is, is sufficient. Um, in galaxy scales, it looks like if you assume dark matter allows, then Newtonian uh, is sufficient. Um, so Mond theorists, uh, so this is modified uh, Newtonian dynamics theorists, they try to um, say that what if dark matter is a figment of imagination and only uh, so the gravity, nature of gravity just changes at large scales, uh, and that's why you see flat rotation curves uh, in the galaxy. Um, there are several different families of these models. Um, not really sure which ones are still alive after LIGO, um, but people do uh, worry about these things. My, yeah, my general feeling is um, just from this formalism, uh, assuming one over R square, we can explain pretty much everything. There is no glaring uh, mystery that needs to be solved. So, um, any other questions? If it is a, if it is, if it's not a Brownian motion as in gas, because the cross, the mean free path is typically uh, much smaller than the crossing time for gas particles. So this is a very weird type of Brownian motion. It, it keeps walking in what, in, okay, let's think of an analogy in 1D. Right, so it's, it's more like um, you really like walking, and you really like walking straight. So you keep walking straight forever, but suddenly you see a really beautiful blue bird, and you say, what is that? And then you turn. And then you keep, straight, keep walking straight because that's what you like to do. So it's that kind of motion. It's not really... Mean free path is way larger than the... So, this is how way larger it is. If you wait long enough, so you keep walking straight and you see uh, millions of blue robins. And every time you see a blue robin, you turn. And then after, after you wait long enough, you will forget where your home is. Okay. Yes. So it really boils down to density. Actually, density and velocity dispersion. It will be the same in ideal gas if somehow you could freeze every gas. Gas particle, sorry. <laughs> 
Anything else? All right, let's... Uh, So this we understand now, this we keep. Um, so let's um, build the formalism that can describe um, self-consistent, self-gravitating phase spaces. And in unrelaxed systems, how these phase spaces evolve over time. Okay. So let's start with something really basic and what we have all seen that is the uh, continuity equation, right? So if you assume that mass is not being created or destroyed, then this holds. So you can write down your mass as a function of time equal to some volume integral times density. So your change of mass becomes del T. Now, if you cannot create or destroy mass, then it must be related to some kind of flow. So let's imagine that in this volume, through the surface of the volume, you have some flow coming in and going out. Okay? So that you can, so this is your, uh, so this would be your soap term in some way. So the density times velocity, that's the flow. And then you are integrating it over all surface. That's your source term. So these two must be equal. So that essentially means d cube x This you can turn into a volume integral by using a divergence inside. So this becomes your d cube x over volume. Ah, this was a. And since this needs to be satisfied in arbitrary volumes, you can just forget about uh, the integral and say that the integrand must be zero in all space. So everyone has seen this, right? So now let's draw this analogy that's similar to mass and its phase space uh, or its spatial distribution and motion. Uh, you have something that is phase space. So this is now not only x. This is x and velocity. So all of that is defined, is governed by some phase space. And we will call it a distribution function. Let's call it F. And this is a function of X, V, and T. 
And since we want, so the definition of this is the probability of finding something in a particular phase space volume. Okay. So to normalize, we can say that integral over all space and all velocities must be 1. Okay. So this normalization, uh, often people play with um, depending on what they are actually trying to find. So for example, if you want to say that what is the probability of having something within a phase space volume, then you use this definition. But oftentimes, that doesn't mean anything in astrophysical contest. What you probably um, are looking for is what is the probability of having this much mass in a particular phase space volume. And then you, it's useful to uh, write some other distribution function and normalize it to the total mass, and so on. But you get the idea. So this is a probability density of finding whatever you are interested in, in the phase space volume. So I have written it in terms of x, v, and t, but actually this is true for, you, you can define a distribution function for any set of canonical variables. Okay? So you can actually convince yourself, so I will not do the derivation here, but, and for simplicity, let's call x, v together as w, okay? And you can convince yourself that for any canonical phase space variables, this is true. So I have written both as w's, but try to write it slightly differently, so to, don't get confused. Um, so this is some other uh, canonical variable, okay? And typically when you go from one coordinate system to another coordinate system, the, you, you write the Jacobian transformation matrices and the distribution functions, all, the, the form of the distribution functions also uh, needs to be transferred. So in terms of canonical variables, um, another identity I want you to remember or remind you. So let's say that uh, there exists something that is conserved, and typically you call it a Hamiltonian, and it is defined in such a way that Q dot is L H del P at some fixed Q and T and P dot is del H del Q at some fixed P and T. So if you have done Hamiltonian uh, formalism in classical mechanics, then this is all um, old for you. Yes, there is. Thanks. So let's try to write down um, how the distribution function should change over time. Taking analogy from this, so uh, here we were saying that mass is not created or destroyed. Here also we will assume that phase space uh, is not created or destroyed. So you have the total phase space and that's it. So if you write it in the same way, you can write it down as del F del T plus 
So I have just replaced rho with f. Let's try to find this, what that is. So del del omega f omega dot is equal to del del q Did you follow all this? So I just uh, differentiated both of these terms with del Q, and so with del P, there will be some D2H del P del Q terms. They will cancel each other, and this is what you will be left with. That's essentially that. this from the definition of Hamilton. So this whole equation becomes del F del T plus Q dot del F del Q plus P dot del F del P. Yes? And this thing for, so we know that F is a function of P, Q, and T. So this is something really important. And this represents a very particular type of self-gravitating distribution of n stars. Uh, did we assume this? So this was the continuity equation, but it's not, um, it, it doesn't direct, okay, it, it does directly follow if omega, no, omega is canonical variables, then this is equivalent to this. Yeah, it may not be a surprise. So, um, 
Can anyone tell me what's the difference between this and this? Some examples. So del f del t is non-zero, but df dt is zero. So at a particular location, this is non-zero. Overall, this is zero. So at any position, the phase space change is related to the changes in its positional uh, things and velocity things. So, for example, uh, I think a waterfall is uh, an example. So, overall, the flow is constant, but at any given point, you have a very high flow. You have a very high flow. So, if you, if you stand uh, or hold something, uh, hold some uh, surface area in the waterfall, then the flow through that surface area at any given time will be very high. But overall, the flow is not changing. So that's important to understand because what it's saying is that if you are moving with a star, then the phase space density around that star is never changing. So all that star is doing is it's changing it's velocity and changing its position, but its phase space density is never changing. And that is a very particular type of flow. Um, and it doesn't satisfy uh, in many cases, but uh, I think laminar flow would be another example, yes. So every star is going through a stationary flow. Yes. So I said that this always doesn't hold, of course. Um, and the ways it can break is uh, okay. So um, before going into that. So all of this formalism is, you should think of at time scales of a few crossing times. So all of this is true if you have the phase space continuum equation to be true. Okay. So if you somehow can create or destroy stellar phase spaces, then this is not true. So for example, um, if you are thinking of uh, stellar evolution that is happening on a few million year time scales for high mass stars, um, you cannot use this equation. So typically these kind of uh, equations are used to uh, describe motion in galaxy where the potential essentially is dominated by dark matter and the total mass essentially is dominated by low mass stars that is not evolving on time scales of interest. So this is also called collisionless Boltzmann equation. Ah. And one um, consequence of this is uh, um, stars without destroying its phase space, when it's true, will keep traveling in the potential and at some point will cover all, all phase space that is available to its energy and angular momentum. Okay. So let's look at some of the limitations. One I have already told you, that is, uh, if f is not conserved, 
So stellar destruction, etc. So you can check when it's um, that's not a problem by just uh, relating it to some of the important time scales. So if you write down the del f del t plus um, let's call it um, h uh, f h. So if h is the Poisson bracket, so that means uh, del f del q. So this whole thing. I'm writing as a bracket. So you can convince yourself that all of these things are dimensionally of some f over time. And you can call it crossing time. And in case you can create or destroy stars, you can write it as a source term say, birth of stars minus death of stars. And this must be small compared to this. So your B minus D over F over T crossing must be way less than 1. And this is usually true for um, any low mass stars. So, for example, Sun's main sequence lifetime uh, is nine-ish billion years. Uh, anything less than yes, yes. There is another way this can break down. So, remember we have. So, for the continuity equation to hold, you need a star phase space not to be changed by some other star, right? So whenever there are these deflections that I was talking about, whenever these deflections are uh, important over a few crossing times, that essentially means that a star one in, with some phase space um, depends on some other star two in some other phase space. So that essentially means that for each star, the phase space density cannot be conserved because it depends on the other stars. So that becomes collisional Boltzmann equation, and there are ways to solve this. And this typically is useful to look at uh, galaxies where um, deflections don't matter on few crossing times. Uh, in globular clusters, or w w in its age, uh, in globular clusters within its age, deflections do matter. So you have to change the collisionless Boltzmann equation in some way. So, um, the reason why I'm not talking in terms of density and talking in terms of phase space is because um, it's a self-gravitating system. So the density profile or structure uh, is actually directly dependent on the phase space. So everything has a mass. And because these masses are there, you have some density. And since velocity dispersion is related to mass enclosed, by specifying a spatial distribution as well as a velocity distribution, which is defining a phase space, is equivalent to telling you everything. So for any given distribution function, you can derive a density uh, profile, you can derive velocity dispersions, positions, etc. cetera. Um, so in mean free path, you don't have a sense of time scale. So in mean free path, you say how, um, how much I will travel before I see a blue robin, but it doesn't say it how long it will take. 
So everything that we are talking about depends on time scales. So we are talking about systems where the age is of order the crossing time, and we are saying that these systems in one crossing does not, that the stars in one crossing does not get affected by other stars. There you go, you, you need to know the average velocity. So you are just telling me that you don't need to know average velocity. So, okay. so you are asking the question wrong. You are asking how many collisions this particle is doing that is a meaningless question because it's incomplete. What you should say is how many collisions a particle do in some time. As soon as you complete the question, you need some information of the velocity. Even in ideal gas, you need uh, velocity and the reason why you don't normally think of velocity is because mean free path is so short and the time between collisions is so short uh, for any relevant time scales of interest. Um, you assume that you are always looking at t equals infinity. So that is the essential definition of thermalization in thermodynamical context. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So this is kind of abstract, right? Um, some phase space density. Um, of course, from phase space density, you can uh, derive a lot of the quantities that typically astrophysicists are uh, interested in. For example, spatial density, mean velocities, um, etc. So, just I will give you a couple of examples, and the others essentially are kind of trivial, and you can think of them yourselves. So, volume density at any given Location is essentially you integrate over all V. Right? That's just a definition. And this is where, um, so remember, I was uh, talking about sometimes you need to play with the normalization. So, for example, if you want to know how many stars are there in a galaxy, uh, and you know that that galaxy is following some form of distribution function, then you might want to write it down as, um, sorry, the number density. will be the total number of stars time new x. And depending on what you want to do, you can um, change the definition for it to normalize to n, and then you don't need to multiply by n. So these are all things typically people use. And typically, um, the kind of observables um, that are available for astronomers is, are the following. So you look at some galaxy, and you can measure the radial velocity um, through Doppler shift of particular lines, and uh, an integrated field of all these stars. 
and their distribution of radial velocities. And you can also do the same thing at different perpendicular distances from the center. And these, all of these things after measurement, you can uh, write down as function of the distribution function and try to get the distribution function that best matches the galaxy. Um, new, new. This is the phase space density. Hmm? This, this, so yes, sorry. This is the spatial density at a particular time. So the number density is the total number of stars times the spatial density of probability. So the, the reason why uh, I always forget to write these T's because uh, in astrophysics we are always looking at a snapshot. Uh, so it's always given that, uh, that it's a particular T. And since the time change time scales are so vast uh, that whatever you are looking at is just taking a snapshot. Um, of course the obvious exceptions are time series astronomy where changes are happening very quickly and you were interested in the changes. Yes? Yes. Yes. So it's so based on the distribution function you can write down um, okay so let's write down another thing. So let's say you are interested in that in the mean velocity of stars at some position and time, that will be something like, so you want to mass weight, uh, will be dq v, um, v, f. So similarly, you can um, take a projection of this along the direction of the line of sight at any given location, and then you integrate that projection and you get the line of sight uh, velocity distribution at that location. You can do it at different locations. Yes. Yes. Um, phase space uh, distribution functions are interesting to look at is again the same thing. So typically we look at things that are not changing on human time scales. So it makes life uh, a lot easier and you will see another reason why it becomes uh, really useful to look at the steady state things. Um, We are saying that this thing is zero. Now if you remember, um, for any kind of motion, there can be integrals of motion. So integrals of motion are defined as this. Say some integral that is zero. That means di dt equal to del i 
del x dx dt plus del i del v del v dv dt equal to zero. That's just the definition of integrals, right? Integrals of motion. Now, just from this form and that form, you can see that for any integral of motion in steady state, you can write that integral of motion as f. So the any in, uh, integral of motion becomes a valid solution of the collisionless Boltzmann equation in steady state. So any i is a solution And you can also show that any function that depends on any number of integrals is also a solution. So let's, that's actually very easy to show. Let's say you define some distribution function that is a function of many integrals of motion. I, you can vary, several i's. And then you can just write down your del f del t, uh, sorry, df dt equals sum of del f del i and this is always zero by definition. So this makes life a lot simpler for us because any integral of motion is constant and it doesn't really matter what integral of motion you use. It can even be functions of several different integrals of motion. Um, the reason why functions of different uh, integrals of motion becomes interesting is because uh, sometimes the trivial integrals of motion, uh, or not, shouldn't say trivial, but uh, straightforward uh, integrals of motions are often not easily measurable. So in that case, you can write, function, write down functions of integrals of motion that might be um, easier to access. I is an integral of motion. So I'm, I'm saying that any integral of motion, just by comparing this equation and this equation, is a solution of f. Yeah? No, this is because this is zero, and that's the definition of integral of motion. So, okay, let me box this one and write down the actual collisionless Boltzmann equation at the bottom. 
So what the collisionless Boltzmann equation says is this. This is the collisionless Boltzmann equation. Um, now, if you get rid of this in steady state, then this is exactly, these two are exactly the same equations. It doesn't necessarily have to. So that means I is a solution of F. Or, so any i would be a solution of this equation. And then this is just saying that it doesn't matter what, uh, how many integrals of motion you use, but if, it, if f is only a function of integrals of motion, then this is also true. Right. So that essentially means that if you have non-zero del f del t, then this i does not satisfy this equation. So in other, so I, I maybe I'm not explaining it well. So let's start with this equation, okay? And. Let's write down the collisionless Boltzmann equation in this way. Del F del X times V, that's dx dt. So. Do you agree? This is the collisionless Boltzmann equation, right? So, but any integral of motion says that this thing must be zero. So unless you are looking for a steady state distribution function where del f del t is zero, integral of motion is not a solution of the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So the, okay, so confusion is coming from this. So in general, x is a function of x, v, and t. i is a function of x and v, by definition. So the only way i can be a solution is if del f del t is zero, which is essentially saying that the distribution function is an integral of motion in some sense. <coughs> but the point of doing it this way is distribution function is not just an integral of motion. Distribution function can be anything and any function of any integral of motion. No. For any distribution function, let's say you found n integrals of motion. They all will be solutions of that distribution function. <coughs> 
and all possible functions involving all of these integrals of motions will all be solutions of distribution. So let's say that you are in a conservative system where energy is not changing. Then energy will be an integral of motion. Then <coughs> energy will satisfy the collisionless Boltzmann equation in steady state. Let's say that you also realize that, hey, angular momentum is also an integral motion for this distribution function. Then angular momentum will also satisfy collisionless Boltzmann equation in steady state. In addition to that, any function involving only energy and angular momentum will be a valid solution of the collisionless Boltzmann equation. Any, you will get the same answer. So the reason why people, um, this is an important result is because oftentimes the, some integrals of motions are easier to detect and some are not. And sometimes no integrals of motions are easy to observe, but some combinations of them are easy to observe. That's when it, these things become important, particularly in astrophysics. So let's say that you don't really know what the energy is, but you, all you can measure is luminosity and some kind of velocity dispersion uh, from, at some distance from the center. So you can, um, so there is no way for you to measure the angular momentum or energy because you are not actually resolving the orbits. But you can assume things like, okay, so if my velocity dispersion is this, I know that it is roughly spherical, so my 3D velocity dispersion will be some uh, geometrical factor times the radial velocity dispersion. So that, if I assume that uh, velocity dispersion is essentially the, uh, governed by the self-gravity, then that is related to the mass enclosed. So from that, you can find out some kind of distribution inside uh, that radius. And from these things, you can derive something that is a function of the total binding energy and the total angular momentum, because now you have the mass distribution and some measure of the velocities at any given location. So the point is, that is okay. If you, even if you cannot measure the actual integrals of motion in Newtonian dynamics, you can measure things that can give you some function of these integrals of motion. That will give you a valid steady state solution for the collision response to equation. Any other questions? any kind of system that you observe in astrophysics almost. So if you're looking at a galaxy, it'll be in steady state. Nothing is changing during the time you were watching it. So that is, a diff that is the general collisionless Boltzmann equation. So now we are looking at steady state to formulate things that will describe what we see. Okay? 
totally confused or kind of okay? That is showing that I still have one hour and 25 minutes. So uh, I am assuming that is not true. Uh, <coughs> so when do I stop again? 12.55, okay. Okay, moving on. So no one is asking questions, but uh, several of you are just mysteriously looking at the board. So I don't know what's going on. Um, but as we defined norm, if you want me to keep talking about the same thing, you have to ask questions. So let's move on. Uh, what do I need? Okay, so what we are going to do now is a specific case of distribution function. So these are called the polytropic distribution functions for reasons you will see very soon. So this is just to give you an idea of um, how you can get families of distribution functions and uh, how to decide which ones are uh, consistent with uh, self-gravitating systems. Okay. So we are going to be writing f in terms of integrals of motion. So let's say that my ch the choice of my integral of motion is the energy and energy is defined as some kind of potential minus the kinetic energy. So this is per mass. Yes, that's at a time. And then you will evolve it with dfdt equals zero. You can write down the Poisson's equation. Um, we're doing spherical and steady state. So there is a, so I'm defining E as this. So typically you are used to seeing it like half V square minus C. So that's the positive energy. That's the binding energy. Good. It just uh, has a negative sign in front of what you're used to seeing. Right, that's the partial equation. Now we are going to assume something. So 
there are several different ways you can uh, derive a distribution function or try to explain the phase space uh, of a galaxy that you see, for example. Uh, one way is to say that my x and v follow some kind of form, and then from there you can try to derive a distribution function that can give a solution that will look like that. So that oftentimes is not very useful in self-gravitating systems that we see. So it's much easier to describe a particular family of distribution function, and then from that you get what is the density, what is the uh, position, what are the velocities, etc. So that's the direction we're taking. So we will assume that F E is for all E greater than zero. If you make that assumption, you can show that it directly follows that rho is 4 pi 0 to infinity So this is coming from spherical symmetry This, I, I just integrated this thing. You can look at uh, standard integrals, and you can write it down. So rho as a function of your potential to some power. And the constant looks like this. And this is finite only when n is greater than half. greater than half. Yes. So this is the Phase space density integrated over all volume. So, so let's. So this is coming from that. So d q v rho f is m. So f is just the probability density. So when you want to get the total, so instead of total probability, if you want the total mass, then you multiply it by rho. And op oppositely, instead of total probability density, if you want the mass density, you multiply the whole thing by m. So 
Uh, I was probably explaining it badly when I was saying that every now and then you will see that there is a need of uh, different normalizations. So for example, when you want, when you're measuring the total mass, you define your distribution function so that integral of that gives you the total mass instead of total probability. So if I had redefined my distribution function uh, to have a normalization that gives, you, gives me a total mass, then you wouldn't have been confused. So let's say that it, it will look like that. Huh? Zero to square root two psi. So at uh, v equals infinity, um, that's where the limit goes. So, yeah. So you need e must be greater than zero. So you don't need to integrate after square root two psi. So from what we find here is to get a self-consistent, spherically symmetric, steady-state distribution function, you can write things down uh, like this. So this is kind of similar to polytropic distributions uh, in hydrostatics, where you connect the density with some form of pressure. Pressure is some uh, function of field. Right? So you are essentially connecting density with field by some power law. So it's very similar idea. So that's why these are called, often called polytropic distribution functions. Okay? But not all polytropes are valid because of this you must have n greater than half. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, oftentimes you don't know what the field is. You can write down the properties of distribution functions and then derive what the field is. So what I'm doing here, I think, is the total mass is 4 by phase space square d phase space f over phase space times something. So this is spherically symmetric, so your volume element becomes this. And then you multiply it with something that takes a probability density to a mass density. 
So this is this is dimensionless. This is mass per phase space volume. So sorry, sorry, sorry. This is this is your um, density in this volume. So you are integrating mass at some position over all v. This is m of x with some distribution of velocities. It's, it's all about definitions, right? So uh, it, it's, uh, there, there is nothing really fundamental going on. It's, it's all about definitions. This is some, say, rho prime. So th this is, so if you define this, right, that's fine. Uh, which which line has the problem? This line. Uh, maybe that's the one of the problems with the normalizations. Um, let me see. Ah, right. So, um, this should be some other distribution function that has, uh, right. So it's, uh, yeah, I probably did some mistake in what exactly f is. I should have called this some um, f prime or something. Right, right. So instead of the normalization to become one, I need the normalization to become something that gives mass. Total volume, yeah. yeah. But uh, otherwise it's fine? Okay. Do I have any time left? Okay. Um, what should I skip? Okay, let me just tell you what uh, some of the results, um, and maybe you can uh, do them by yourself at home. So, in principle, if you understand everything so far. So you are already uh, catching the mistakes. That's really great news. That means you are understanding it perfectly. Um, so let me just tell you some results that are useful in astrophysics. And so I have already uh, told you that this is kind of hydrostatic polytropic equations. Um, but then, that's um, not, there is a no direct correspondence between the two. So you can, um, so by comparing 
this and then writing down the same kind of Poisson's equation for gas, you can show that Cn is gamma minus 1 over k gamma to the power 1 over gamma minus 1. Uh, which also means gamma, and uh, so this is another identity. So this is all uh, about if you want this kind of distribution functions to be similar to hydrostatic uh, distributions, then these should hold. And this, and this essentially means that gamma must be greater than so if gamma is greater than 3 then n becomes less than half right so you are writing this, this is just normal equation, and then if you keep doing DPDR, um, so the hydrostatic e equation would be right, that's the hydrostatic equation. And then you can do some more algebra, and you can write things down um, such that you get something like rho to the gamma minus 1 equals gamma minus 1 over k gamma times pi. So this is exactly the same form as this. So rho is a function of the field. This is also rho as a function of the field. Now, if you take this comparison seriously, then you can show that gamma must be related to n as this. And since we know that n must be greater than half, then you can see that gamma greater than 3 does not have any corresponding self-gravitating system. So although we call it polytropic distribution functions, not all polytropes are valid, and only those with n greater than half are valid in gravitating systems. No, what I'm saying is, if gamma greater than 3, then n less than half, and this is invalid. OK? And then there are two particular cases. Um, so, by definition, factorial minus 1 is minus infinity. So, that's where uh, this is coming from. So, you don't want it to blow up. Um, let me see. So, sorry. If n equals 1, then it becomes minus half, right? So that is greater than minus infinity. So then it become not, doesn't remain a factorial. It becomes a gamma function. But it's greater than minus infinity. 
And there are two special cases that are uh, very interesting. One is n equals 5. If you put in n equals 5 and do a lot of algebra, uh, then you can get a Plummer sphere. And let's see if I remember correctly. No, actually, um, it's not as straightforward. So let's continue that later. So uh, to get these kinds of plumber spheres or harmon um, uh, wave equations, uh, all of these need a very particular type of potential that I haven't said yet. So if you, this is only true if you say that the field is only a function of R. And we can do it uh, in the next class, maybe. So, any questions? Direct physical significance of this n greater than half that you can bring in. Like that basically means that the density has to be psi raised to greater than half, right? So yes. I mean. uh, the physical significance is that uh, you want your field to be right. <laughs>